Empress, The Secret History of Anna Kay, Introduction to the First Edition, by me, Greg Oliar. In the event that you recognize my name at all, it's almost certainly in association with my political writing. Perhaps you subscribe to my Substack, Prevail, or listen to my podcast, also called Prevail. Maybe you follow me on Twitter, where my frequent threads on Trump Russia were widely shared during the administration of the defeated former guy, thus catapulting me from obscure novelist to obscure novelist with 190,000 followers. Nothing there hints at how I might have come into possession of the medieval manuscript you're about to read, an honest-to-God genuine artifact from the high Middle Ages. Something like this is usually published in association with an August museum or a fancy university and shepherded by a scholar of great renown, not an English major who tweets too much. So I understand the confusion. Let me come clean. Writers, and novelists especially, like to cultivate the impression that we're well off, that we bank so much coin from book royalties that we can afford to sit around all day eating bonbons and work in the Twitter machine. This is mostly fantasy. The novel, what a misnomer that, is a dying art form, like opera or ballet. The average novel sells fewer than a thousand copies and has a total readership that would fit comfortably in the auditorium of your local high school. With the obvious exception of fiction writing royalty like Stephen King and J.K. Rowling and, I don't know, Dean Kuntz and the like, novelists must hustle to make ends meet. We teach classes in creative writing. We freelance for what few publications still pay for content. We run social media for corporate websites. We moonlight at advertising agencies. We sell real estate and life insurance. We marry investment bankers. I'm no exception. I, too, have a day job. For the last 10 years, I've worked for a wholesale company that deals in ancient coins, Greek, Roman, Crusader, and so on. I handle product development. My job is to concoct stories about the various coins to make them more appealing to our customers. For example, no one has heard of Sigismund of Luxembourg, a minor Hungarian king of the early 15th century, and thus no one much cares about the crappy little silver coins struck half a millennium ago in his long-forgotten kingdom. But Sigismund of Luxembourg founded the Order of the Dragon, a secret society whose mission was to repulse the Turks, and which membership gave Dracula his nickname. Draculea is Romanian for Little Dragon. So, packaged in a snazzy Dracula box and attractively priced, these same crappy little silver coins, thousands of which had languished in our company's vault for decades before my arrival, quickly sold out. Our company is active in the ancient coin market. We buy big lots of relatively inexpensive coins, which we then wholesale to retail coin dealers. Late Roman bronzes are our bread and butter. I know so much about Constantine the Great that I could walk into a classroom right now and give an hour-long off-the-cuff lecture, the same way a car dealer could riff for hours on this or that iteration of Ford Mustang. Judean prutas, which we sell as biblical widow's mites, are also perennial bestsellers. That's usually what's on offer, and that's typically what we buy. But every so often, we come across something novel. Once we bought a lot of Norman silver deniers struck by William the Conqueror from a newbie dealer from Rouen who barely spoke English. My boss negotiated the deal in his rudimentary schoolboy French, and the agreement was literally drawn up on a napkin. That lot sold at a tidy profit a few weeks later. The Frenchman found us at the Big Berlin coin show, referred to us by another dealer. Word of mouth is also how we came into possession of a hoard of medieval coins, some 3,000 total, struck by various Byzantine emperors from the late 11th through the early 12th centuries. Skyfates, or cup coins, are roughly the size of a quarter, but convex in shape like a contact lens. On one side is a portrait of Jesus Christ. On the other, the emperor, sometimes with his wife or his sons. The portraits are all rendered in that strange Byzantine style that looks like something from a medieval sci-fi comic. The coins are struck in billin, an alloy best described as bad silver. So, this particular hoard was discovered on the 2nd of September 2016 in a sealed lead pot by construction workers building a strip mall in the Zyderek neighborhood of Istanbul. Initially thrilled at their apparent good fortune, executives at the construction company were disappointed to learn that the coins were dirt common. Byzantine skyfates in extra fine condition retail for something like 20 bucks, if you can find a willing buyer. The buried treasure wasn't much of a treasure, not to a big corporation anyway. After clearing it with the Erdogan government, the executives unloaded the lot to a Bulgarian coin dealer, a slight man with a horror movie aspect owing to his hair lip and his vampiric accent, who in turn sold it to my boss, 
lock, stock, and proverbial barrel for 12,000 euro. My boss immediately flipped a thousand of the coins to a dealer in Canada for the same price, which means that, in effect, we acquired 2,000 Byzantine coins for nothing. When the shipment arrived in our upstate New York warehouse, we were shocked to discover, inside the original container, a rolled up stack of yellowed parchment. My boss freaked out. He was wary of getting involved with antiquities. There had been half a decade earlier a series of high profile arrests of antiquities dealers of his acquaintance. Syrians living in London alleged to be fencing stolen artifacts to finance jihad, so he preferred to stick to cheap coins, which tend to move more easily through customs. When I offered to take the thing off his hands for $1,000, and, more importantly, to handle whatever paperwork was necessary to make it good with the Office of Foreign Assets Control, he happily agreed. I reached out to an old college friend, Marina Gavaris, a tenured professor of medieval studies at Georgetown, our alma mater. She's one of those freakishly brilliant people who speaks seven languages, including medieval Greek. She agreed to translate the pages, and also, critically, arranged for Dumbarton Oaks, a prominent Byzantine research library within walking distance of her office, to both finance the project and clear it with the OFAC. As part of the deal, Dumbarton Oaks would retain the physical codex when she finished with the translation, which was fine by me. For my troubles, I would get the publishing rights. Although, when I drove down to Washington to hand deliver the thing, I had no idea what those publishing rights might involve. Marina warned me that the codex was likely nothing. An inventory of goods, a household budget, liturgical documents, something prosaic like that. When she began to read the faded Greek minuscule letters, however, her eyes widened so much, I was afraid they might pop out of her head entirely. Holy shit, exclaimed the learned Byzantine scholar. Holy fucking shit. The codex was neither inventory of goods, nor household budget, nor a liturgical document, but rather a lost manuscript by the Byzantine princess Anna Komnini. Anna, the firstborn daughter of the emperor Alexios Komnenos, is the author of the Alexiad, an exhaustive history of her father's long and eventful reign. Both princess and book are largely forgotten now, familiar only to Byzantinists, like my friend Marina, but her chronicle remains one of the finest extant primary sources on the First Crusade. The newly discovered codex, known as the Anecdota, or Secret History, is a shockingly modern companion piece to the Alexiad. The pages that follow comprise the first English language edition of what Marina insists is one of the great literary works of the High Middle Ages. A random twist of fate led me, a novelist, to be the publisher of this remarkable work. Appropriately so, unlike the Alexiad, which is part history, part hagiography, and frankly a bit on the dull side, the secret history reads like a novel. Perhaps that art form isn't dead after all? Here is a book, painstakingly compiled and stashed away before anyone could ever lay eyes on it, nine centuries ago, read for the first time by a medieval scholar, a woman, which seems significant, at a university on a continent that Anna Komnini herself did not know existed, almost a full millennium later. And those faded scribbles of ink on decaying parchment, the very words and in incantation, somehow have the power to restore, to reanimate, a world long since vanished. Is that mere art? Is it not closer to magic? And now, the secret history of Anna Komnini. Preface The stream of time will wash away the dark stain of our delible memory. Sure as the rushing river smooths the stone on its bank, no man mortal or otherwise is impervious to these relentless waters. Even the gods are forgotten. This, the astute reader will recall, was my stated motivation for writing the Alexiad, to give account of the deeds of my esteemed father, the great Emperor Alexios Komnenos. It is with some irony, then, that my own memories are refusing to wash away, or at any rate are not washing away fast enough. Time takes its time. Ancient as I am, at sixty-nine, withered and broken in my modest rooms at Ketcherodomini, I find that not an hour passes without my mind turning to the events chronicled in that book of mine, and not for the reasons one might suppose. The historian, as I wrote therein, must shirk neither remonstrance with his friends nor praise of his enemies. He is in the service only of truth. And this, more than anything, is what gnaws at me now. While I did not bear false witness, 
nor did I tell the full story. Much was left unsaid or unremarked upon, much ignored, in order not to bestow credit upon some heroic character other than my father. The women especially I have marginalized, my irrepressible grandmother and namesake Anna Dallacine, the formidable empress Eudokia Macromboladisa, and most of all the lovely Maria of Alenia, who was so forthcoming in relating to me the momentous events of her incredible life. These egregious omissions fill me with shame. Of all people, I should have known not to downplay the female contributions to our proud history. It is Candlemas Day, Anno Domini 1153. John the Second Comnenos, my hapless half-brother and my father's unworthy successor, is sixteen years dead. His flouncing son Manuel now occupies the throne, my throne, or rather the throne that would have been mine were I not of the weaker sex, the throne that should have been mine regardless. I, Anna Comneni, lost queen of the Byzantines. Men cannot know the anguish of being ruled ineligible on anatomical grounds beyond one's control. Slaves can perhaps understand eunuchs, too, and perhaps even those doomed nobles like the deposed Emperor Romanos Diogenes, whose eyes have been put out. But not men. How apposite is the scripture, Adam content in his slothful ignorance, lazy ruler of all he surveys, Eve ripe with fecund curiosity and grand ambition, Eve punished for the selfsame willful attributes gifted her by her creator. The cruel vicissitudes of fate, of which the Tradean sang so plagiantly, my tale is worthy of Aeschylus or Sophocles. I will not lie, it is a struggle to avoid bitterness. Tragedies often end in death, as a cursory survey of Greek drama shows, but death at least is respite from bitterness and rage and humiliation. Real tragedy is confinement to a convent, house arrest in this forgotten place, exiled to irrelevancy, the blind Oedipus, or Diogenes, wandering the earth. Impotence, celibacy, boredom, intellectual stagnation, rot. The machine of government grinds on without me entombed as I am in this mausoleum by another name. My nephew, traipsing round the grand palace in those ridiculous pantaloons, entertains infidels, but will not grant his aunt an audience. My own children scorn me. My friends, there were never, let us be true, very many, have all passed on. I have managed the best I could. When my husband died a dozen and a half years ago, he left behind fragments of a manuscript, a history he'd intended to continue to the present day, or at least through the reign of Alexios that ended in Anno Domini 1118. I picked up where he left off, although his scholarship was too shoddy to be of much use, by completing Nikephoros Borenios the Younger's history of Alexios Comnenos, I could honour both my husband and my father. This was the well-intended advice the Mother Abbess put before me. Serve the memory of the two distinguished men who were your masters, she said. And so I did, to a degree that even my kindly Mother Abbess scarce could have imagined. The Alexiad not only far exceeds the immature scribblings of my husband, but ranks, dare I say, with the works of Herodotus and Xenophon. Certainly the blundering Celis is not my match, as he could never resist the temptation as I have, although I have more reason to include myself than that old fraud, to insert himself so prominently in every relevant scene. So long as the Alexiad exists, Alexios Comnenos and Nikephoros Borenios the Younger will never be forgotten. No daughter or wife has ever given greater glory to father and husband. Selflessly have I acted in composing my history, but history is not well served by selflessness. Mea culpa, I have presented a flawed account. O oh, history, I have betrayed thee, just as I was myself betrayed by my father, by my husband, by my very anatomy. The reward of suffering is experience, the playwright wrote. But he has it wrong. It's the other way around. The reward of experience is suffering. The guilt of my literary deceit weighs heavily on me. I lie awake at night, 
Beneath the habit, what little hair that remains falls out in clumps. If the truth is ever to be told, I am the only one left to tell it, and tell it I must. I must atone for the sin of redaction, a sin for which neither presbyter nor patriarch can offer true absolution. Let these pages be my penance, O God. The Astrologer At half past ten in the morning, on the first day of the twelfth month of the year of our Lord, 1083, a eunuch burst out of the Porphyra and hurried into the nearby chambers of the court astrologer, an Antiochene by birth, who had served the emperors of Rome since the days of Monomachus. The astrologer was at his writing desk, Ephemerides at the ready, awaiting the eunuch's arrival. What was the time? Just now, Sarah. The astrologer nodded, ran his silt-brown fingers through his thick white beard, and turned to his books. That year's ephemeris first, then the well-worn copy of Claudius Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos. As he made his notation, the crooked smile broke across his grizzled brown face. After ten minutes of furious computation, he put down his pen and exclaimed, But God is good! to no one in particular, as the dutiful eunuch had already returned to the Porphyra to attend to the new mother and her baby. The old man rose and practically ran down the hall to the royal apartments, dizzy with excitement. He found the emperor in the map room, anxiously pacing to and fro, wearing holes in the rugs. "'What news?' the Augustus cried. "'The child is born,' the old man said. "'And your excellency, the stars are a thing of wonder.' He went on to analyze the needle chart of the emperor's firstborn and heir to the throne. The position of Mars in the first house, so close to the horizon. Your grace, you could not ask for better placement. Mars, the astrologer explained, although the emperor was himself familiar with Ptolemy and did not require remedial instruction, was ruler of war, and thus its position on the ascendant indicated an assertive, self-confident aspect well suited to command. This child was a natural-born leader, the sort of man others would happily follow into battle, even into certain death. Not unlike yourself, he added, in a tone of well-practiced obsequity. He had not retained his position for so long without knowing how and when to deploy blandishments. The emperor nodded, and the old sycophant continued, And Jupiter, also so close to the horizon, Jupiter is the great benefic. This is a lucky child, your grace. Lucky, indeed. This pleases me, the emperor said. Thank you, Sira. That is all. The astrologer was banished to Proti the very next day, after the emperor discovered, to his eternal disappointment, given the auspicious astrological reading, that the baby crying in the Porphyra, his firstborn child and presumptive heir, was in fact... A girl. The emperor was Alexios Komnenos. The baby girl was me. By the time I was born in the purple, of course, my father was firmly ensconced on the throne, having been Augustus for two full years. Any lingering questions about his legitimacy had been answered with his empire-saving military victories over Robert the Fox and the Normans at the beginning of his reign, of which more later. Before Larissa, however, such questions plagued him, for Alexios, let us not forget, was a usurper. That his great-uncle Isaac Comnenos had been emperor decades earlier indicated that he was of noble stock. But this in itself was not much of a claim. Alexios was not even the oldest of the Komnenoi. His beloved brother, named Isaac, in homage to the former emperor, had held that distinction since the death of their eldest brother, Manuel, at Manzikert. Why should this upstart, this third son of the brother of a former emperor, wear the purple? Why should Alexios Komnenos, of all people, be the one to supplant the more or less rightful ruler, Botaniates? divine providence, some would say, and surely God willed his speedy ascension. Others would credit the kingly mix of charisma, piety, cunning, and ambition that formed his personality, and certainly a lesser mortal would not have pulled it off. 
but the political genius who engineered the coup, who plucked my father from his post as domestic of the schools and installed him on the throne, was neither Alexios nor God. No, there was, as is often the case in the long annals of Rome, a puppet master, or mistress, as it were, just off stage, tugging at the marionette strings. My father never told me the story of the astrologer, you see. It was related to me by the other occupant of the map room on the morning I was born, when the old stargazer made his blunder. For Alexios was not alone on the 1st of December, A.D. 1083. He was never alone in those days. He was always in the company of his lover, the most beautiful woman in the kingdom, if not all of Christendom, who had been the wife of the decrepit Botaniades, and also wife to the emperor before him, Michael the Seventh Ducus. It was this erstwhile empress, a foreigner by birth, who devised the grand scheme, who set the pieces in motion, and who did not rest until the deed was done. Without Maria of Alania, there is no Alexios. In order to fully appreciate how much his improbable rise depended on her benisons, and how my own modest accomplishments would have been impossible without her inestimable influence and exemplary example, we must speak in greater detail of Maria, whose life, it must be said, is just as worthy of an epic as was my father's, if not more so. She is given short shrift in the Alexiad and I must use the requisite pages to correct this oversight now. Before we commence that discussion, however, there is one last detail in the story of my birthday that I must relate. It is a purient detail, and I disapprove of purients in all its forms, but I feel that full disclosure is necessary here, as this detail illustrates more than any discursive editorial I might proffer the dynamics of the relationship between my father and his comely lover. You see, Alexios was not pacing when the daft astrologer made his fateful entrance in the map room. That is a fiction I invented for purposes of decorum. No, adding to his humiliation, the old fool caught the emperor and his lover in flagrante delicto. There lay Maria upon the lush divan, her fair legs splayed, her pretty head cocked back, and there was the mighty Augustus on his knees before her, lapping at her fountain like a thirsty mongrel. A gorgeous icon of the Virgin Mary hung on the wall behind the divan, smiling radiantly and chastely upon them. At thirty-two, Maria of Alania was already an old woman by then, five years his senior, twice divorced, with a young son of her own. Ruined beyond ruination, by any conventional metric, and yet still as alluring as the fairest courtesan half her age. As soon as the door to the map-room was shut and they were again alone, my love-drunk father, with nary a thought to his wife or his new-born heir, fell prostrate before his lady, and in that base position unbecoming his high office, resumed his obscenity. I did not release him, Maria told me later, one of many secrets she was to reveal, until my desire was satisfied. Maria, maker of emperors, Maria, mother of my betrothed, Maria, who raised me, who loved me as her own. In the convent all these years later, when I offer prayers to the mother of God, no matter the radiant countenance of the icon before me, the face of the Virgin Mary in my mind is the face of the Empress Maria. Thanks for listening to this excerpt from Empress, The Secret History of Anna Kay by Greg Oliar. The preface and first chapter were read by Alison Weller. The music is called Sad Eyes by Dar Golan. Empress is available on September 18, 2022 on Amazon and at better bookstores everywhere. Thanks for listening.